Okay, Adrian, what do we have on tap for today? So I was um, thinking this morning uh, about the stuff we're going to talk about and, and see if I could tell you a story that makes sense. So back around mid to late 2000s, I bought a car that became one of my favorites of all time. And I've been very, very fortunate. I was thinking through this morning, I, I've owned so many cars or at least so many cars while well, both. I think I stopped counting around about 60 or 65. It was insane how many cars I've owned in the last two and a half decades or so. That's I've a, been little, very <laughs> a little excessive there. Yeah. Well, you know, at one time I had a big collection all at the same time of some really crazy exotics. Before 2000, uh, some of you, if you're old enough, will remember uh, before the internet bubble or during the internet bubble, the stock market was going through the roof and simultaneously my business was exploding. We were doing a lot of really good work and all this money was coming in. I was throwing into the stock market and it seemed like almost every day stocks just went up. And I thought, genius, I'm so good at this. And I was making all this money and I was trading and I would take the money out and I'd go buy a car, I'd buy watches. Uh, anyway, uh, um, so right around about 2006, 2008, I can't remember exactly when, I bought my, my third Porsche. It was the uh, 996 C4S. Uh, it was the water cool and yes, all you Porsche files, you don't have to go into it. I don't really care. The 993 was great. I had it. It wasn't as good as you know a lot of people th say it is. It certainly had a lot of issues, but this 996 was spectacular. First of all, it had the turbo body style, um, but it didn't have the turbo, so I didn't get the lag. Uh, it was convertible, so it was fun to drive in the summer, but I also had the hard top for the winter. So when it was, I drove this car virtually every day that I owned it. Uh, I think it was two years old when I got it, so I got it at a uh, a much reduced price, which is the theme for uh, today's uh, conversation. Anyway, for about, I want to say about six or eight years, I can't remember exactly when, I kept that car and I drove it almost every day, despite the fact that I had all these other exotics as well, because it was such a great car to drive every day. It was uh, practical for me. I didn't have to carry a lot of people most of the time, so it was just me. I would do sometimes deliveries, the, the back would come out, I would put the top down, I would stick stuff in the car that would just stick out of the car, it didn't matter to me, I'd go to Home Depot and buy, anyway, um, in the middle of the worst winters, I would drive it unless the snow was really, really high, I'd just put snow tires and I would get going. By the time I was done with the car, it had about 300 and somewhat thousand kilometers, which is, what, about 200,000 miles? I sold it to a friend of mine who uh, owns a, a, a used car dealership, an exotic used car dealership. Um, he gave it to his son, and his son is still driving the car to this day. Now, in all that time, I had no issues with the car except for regular wear and tear stuff, right? brakes and you know that kind of stuff, but it was fantastic. So anyway, I was thinking about that um, because today we're going to talk about our newest uh, used equipment haul. Now, we sell primarily new equipment, as you know, but once in a while we get some great used equipment, and I'm gonna go through some today. So starting here, this is the Wilson Max Series 1. Now, why do I think of the Porsche that I love so much when I think of the Maxes? At the time, Wilson's top-of-the-line speaker was called the Grand Slam. It was a whole lot of money. It's like 80 or 90,000 US dollars, uh, back around, uh, let me see, I think I've got some notes here, yeah. Um, yeah, back around 1998 was when the speaker was first introduced and it was made until 2004. Anyway, the, the, the Grand Slam was fantastic. We sold a lot of those speakers. I was shocked at how many of those we sold. Um, but it's also a much, much bigger speaker and obviously not ev not everybody can afford it. And then right below that was the Watt Puppy, which again, if you lost it after the Grand Slams, um, the Watt Puppy didn't quite do it for you. So. David Wilson and his team came up with the uh, Maxes. It was sort of the bridge in between. And for me, the Max today represents one of the finest values in high-end speakers that you can get into today. Let me explain. First of all, 
even way back then, you can already see what Wilson was paying attention to, which was the time alignment. Here you have the uh, mid-range high frequency module, you have the separate base uh, uh, enclosure. The enclosures are made of the M and the uh, X material, which of course Wilson has since subsequently uh, improved many, many generations later. Um, all these drivers were chosen specifically for the neutrality, their speed, and the, the way that they could blend together. Very, very important. Uh, in other words, while you could certainly buy drivers or make drivers that are maybe more exotic, like made of ceramic or diamond or beryllium or unobtainium, the problem is if you get, a, a, for example, a tweeter that has incredible properties, but the mid-range doesn't have that same property, what you end up doing is you hear this, the discontinuity. You hear how great the tweeter is, and you also simultaneously hear that the mid-range is lacking substantially. As an example, early Martin Logan hybrid speakers, the sequels, the monoliths, they had these problems. Not with the, um, the maxes. The maxes are very coherent. Again, if you've never heard it, go take a listen to it. For some of you who've heard the early ones like these, and let's say you found them bright, I can guarantee you the speakers themselves are not bright, unless you happen to be very specifically sensitive to high frequencies. Um, match them up properly, set them up properly with proper cables and so on, they're not bright, uh, at least not to my ears. And, and back when I was young, I certainly could hear all the high frequencies in the world. Um, I love these because they, like my Porsche, could do virtually everything that you'd want it to do and do it in comfort. So you could play any kind of music you can possibly think of, from reggae all the way to the most subtle of uh, violin concertos. Um, the image, like nobody's business, the, the sound stage was huge and wide and deep. Um, they play very, very loud, but they can also play at a whisper. Um, so f that's why when I was thinking about these speakers, my mind went back to uh, the Porsche 911, the 996. So, um, some um, um, details about these speakers. The, the gentleman who owned these speakers, he's the second owner. I sold the speakers originally, and then the, the gentleman who, who bought it for me originally traded it in to buy another big Wilson's, and so then I sold it uh, to John, uh, uh, and, uh, oh, sorry, Stephen. And then Stephen kept it for decades until very, very recently when he went nuts. He just went totally crazy and bought big, big, big Wilsons and these are here for sale. Um, so for all those years, he was totally satisfied. Just and understandably why. But like my Porsche, over time, certain things need to be re uh, replaced. So early Wilsons, they use these diffraction panels in the front, these, these foam pads. And over time, these foam pads would disintegrate. And um, they're a major pain to get off, as uh, my, my, my young kid who's uh, joined us recently can attest, because we gave him the task of getting rid of the old foam pads and you have to scrape it, you have to use Goo Gone like liberally and just let it sit and then still scrape it and then apply more and scrape it. Anyway, finally it's all done. We've got all new pads um, for, for the woofer and the tweeters for both speakers. The previous owner also replaced um, the tweeters and the mid-range drivers because he wanted them to be the late, uh, new uh, because he's owned it for so many years. Um, so the woofers are fine. Everything works perfectly as they should. Um, and then the resistors in the back have also been replaced again because over time uh, resist it's a good idea to replace the resistors. So we've replaced the resistors as well. So these speakers have been fully refreshed. Um, and on top of which they come with isoacoustics Gaia for uh, because he preferred it uh, to the spikes uh, that the Wilsons come with. But also at the same time, the nice thing about these uh, isoacoustic gaias is that they don't mark your floor like spikes. Even if you put the spikes on floor protectors, you can still get a, a mark on the floor. With these ones, all that pressure is um, distributed over a much bigger area, so you won't get marks on the floor. At least I don't think you will. Anyway, um, so uh, these speakers, we're selling them for $16,000 Canadian, which is uh, 12,000 US dollars. Now, we don't have the original crates. However, we do have 
I believe we still have a, a, a set of crates from a pair of Alex's, which are roughly the same size and we can potentially try and make it work if we need to ship it. Uh, or if they won't work, then you'll have to pay for custom-made crates. The last time we made some crates for a speaker similar to this size was about 2,000 Canadian. So just so you know. Um, but the crates are made really nice big thick uh, plywood and so on and they'll uh, uh, be reusable again. Anyway, that's what these speakers are. Um, for those of you who've heard these speakers or own these speakers, love to see your comments below and uh, tell me what you think of them. And if you haven't heard these in a long time again, I would highly recommend. If you're in the market at all for really high performance, great speakers, you owe it to yourself to hear these. These are unbelievable. Okay, we're gonna cut here. I'll bring you to the other room and show you the other stuff that we have for you. Okay, I started this video uh, talking about my most memorable um, car that I've owned and I mentioned that I had bought it used. It was about two or three years old when I bought it. It was the Porsche 996 C4S. And what I'm gonna show you is also in the same vein in terms of performance and value, like real performance and value. This is the Class A Audio preamp, Delta preamp, and the Class A Audio monoblocks, the Delta monoblocks. So who's Class A Audio, in case you don't know? Um, back in the early 80s, I wanna say, Class A Audio was first formed, and the name Class A Audio was a play on the words Class A, because back then, Class A Audio believed that the only way to make an amplifier, a truly good amplifier, was pure Class A. And uh, Mike might, uh, or Mike or Allison will, will search the internet and look for the originals. They were called the DR2s. They were these tall amplifiers with vertical heat sinks that looked like toasters. It was incredible. Uh, and they put out like 25 watts. But they were pure Class A. Now, I stress the word pure because Lots of amplifiers today will claim to be Class A and so on, and if you go by the strict definition of pure Class A, a pure Class A amplifier runs very, very, very hot, and it's very difficult to get much more than 100 or so watts out of a regular uh, outlet. Um, so, so amplifiers that claim to be a 1,000 watt Class A and so on, uh, not by strict definition. Uh, maybe some sort of sliding or... or, or uh, uh, um, uh, s yeah, sliding bias Class A, but certainly not by, by standards of pure Class A. Anyway, um, fast forward many, many years later, Class A audio uh, is now um, a mix of Class A and Class A B. Well, we'll start with the preamp first. This is, uh, Class A audio now makes the Delta series. I think it's the only series that they make. Uh, the Delta is, uh, what I noticed, in researching the product is that they pay tremendous attention to noise reduction. And I'll go into some of the details in a moment. So the Class A preamplifier, the Delta preamplifier, uh, is a DAC and a preamp built into one, and it's extremely full function. For example, uh, the DAC section will inc uh, includes things like Ethernet inputs, a USB, uh, AES EBU balanced, um, uh, Toslink, and, and RCA. So that's just the DAC. And then you've got all the balanced inputs and RCAs and so on. Um, and then in, uh, on top of which it has uh, triggering capabilities so you can connect your system with just one wire and turn it on and off that way. There's also a digital EQ capable. So there's five band EQ as well as parametric and two subwoofers. Uh, you can either use one sub or two subs if you want. And uh, so everything is uh, adjustable in those kinds of, in the tone uh, adjustments, that's all done in the digital uh, domain. So it's, again, much lower noise and you don't end up with too much phase shift like in the analog domain. Uh, here you have the touch panel, a uh, touch screen. And um, as you can see, you can get into all kinds of different settings and so on. I won't, sh I won't go into it because there's a lot to do. But suffice to say, you can do all of that on the touch screen. You can also do most of it on your, this is a very chunky remote. Uh, Mike will take a close up with it. It's metal and what's also nice is it's got rubber feet at the back so you can put it on top of stuff and not worry about scratching the surface. Um, you can also download a free app for your iPhone or Android device, which again is very, very cool. Um, 
So anyway, and it's got a headphone uh, jack as well for headphones. This uh, preamplifier, we're selling it. Uh, oh, and it also comes with the optional HDMI card as well. So if you want to hook up your system to your smart TV, you can watch your um, your TV and your movies through your stereo system with that uh, HDMI uh, optional card. That's about a $500 option. The regular price of the Delta is 10,000 US dollars or 13,999, 14,000 Canadian. Uh, that's before the optional card. We're selling it for 6,000 US or 83,99 Canadian. So that's 40% off. And this is in great shape. Um, now let's talk about the mono blocks. This uh, amplifier, same, same client, was bought, I think he received it February of this year, so roughly about six months old. Now this amplifier puts out um, 35 watts in pure class A, and then after that it switches to AB. Mm -hmm. it's, rated, um, it's rated for 300 watts into 8 ohms, 600 watts into 4 ohms, or 1,000 watts into 2 ohms, so very, very high current. It'll drive any speaker you can possibly think of. Um, again, I mentioned earlier about the fact that they pay so much attention to noise reduction. Here are some details. Custom toroidal transformers. And, and toroidal transformers are some of the quietest if you design, if, if you design properly. Uh, low noise and efficiency. They use um, six-layer uh, six circuit boards again to minimize noise because the signal path is much much shorter as a result of that and again you get very low noise. True balance design from input and output. Now it's got both XLR and uh, single-ended inputs. If you use the single-ended input when it goes into the amplifier it's actually converted into balance. Um, again that's because the factory believes uh, that balance is the only way to go and rightfully so. Um, if you want the, the highest signal to noise ratio and the best dynamics possible, you have to lower noise and that's how you do it. Um, same with the preamp by the way, all the, if you use RCA inputs, when it gets into the amplifier, it's converted to balance. Um, they use 22 four-pole Mundorf capacitors, same as over here, they use Mundorf capacitors. And for those of you uh, who may not know, Mundorf is a German company, they make custom boutique capacitors, they're among some of the very, very best and very expensive. Um, again, in the theme of noise reduction, they have custom NAVCOM feet, um, can't really see it, but um, again, to absorb vibrations and minimize noise. And then finally, on the back of the amplifier, they use uh, Furutech rhodium plated RCAs and speaker connectors. So Furutech, some of you will know, uh, makes incredible high quality parts. And they chose the rhodium plated RCAs and the speaker connectors. And, and again, they'll show you the back. Oh, actually, I'll turn it around later and show you. Um, the speaker connectors are very, very cool. Um, then if you look at this amplifier in the front, you'll see, first of all, a meter. Um, and that shows you the amount of power that you're using and it goes from 0 to 600 watts. Then you'll see this slot in the front and that's basically their way of thermal management for the, for the amplifier. You'll notice there are no heat sinks. Well that's because they use this. There's a very very quiet fan that draws air in and exhausts it out. So this way the amplifier's um, uh, uh, temperature is always managed and monitored very important to be aware of this. Although heat sinks will work quite well, the problem is that heat sinks are passive devices. And so if your amplifier gets really, really hot, um, your heat sink may not wick away the heat as efficiently. And one of the things about this system is that it's actively monitoring all the time. Um, John Atkinson did a review of this amplifier and he measured uh, the way that he measures his amplifiers before, well, before he measures the amplifiers, I should say, he preconditions the amplifier according to the uh, IEC standard. And what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to put a signal into the amplifier at one third uh, to, 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 uh, that pushes the amplifier to its one third rated output. So in other words, if the amplifier is rated at 300 watts, you put enough signal into the amplifier so it puts out 100 watts. And you precondition it for, I can't remember if he says for uh, an hour or something like that, but by that time, most amplifiers will get extremely hot because 100 watts continuous for an extended period of time is very, very, very hot. It gets very hot. 
and he mentioned in the review that it was relatively cool and again that's because of the thermal management system now why am I getting going to all of this because heat is the enemy of all electronics over time as your amplifiers get uh, uh, get to deal with the excessive heat, the parts inside will degrade. And so if you can manage the heat consistently and cool it, then the amplifier will be much more reliable and last much, much, much longer. Um, so that's what they've done with this amplifier. The I, they call it the ICT, which is a, uh, a little play on, on, on the name IC. IC um, uh, yeah, they call it IC Tunnel. So. Um, anyway, uh, the other thing that's also very cool is that with the amplifier's design, when you first turn it on, within minutes the amplifier will get to proper operating temperature, which means that the sound will be stabilized very, very quickly, again, due to the um, heat management. Each amplifier weighs 100 pounds. That's insane. So again, um, I want to point out this amplifier is only about six months old, and the only reason it's for sale, just like this pre-amplifier, is because the client again, upgraded very, very, very dramatically, and that's the only reason. And in fact, he was somewhat uh, um, crestfallen that he had to do it in order to get these huge, very expensive amplifiers, but you know, suffice to say, it's worth it for him. The amplifier is normally 21,998 US, so 22,000 US or 30,000 Canadian. We're selling it for 13,500 US, or 18,000 Canadian, again, six months old. The preamp is a bit older. I, ca I don't know exactly how old it is, but it's a still a hell of a buy because we're selling it, I think I mentioned, for 6,000 US or 83, 8,400 Canadian. Okay, last but not least, now we're talking about this unit here. This is the Boulder 1006 or 1008. I can never remember. 008. <laughs> 1008 phono preamplifier. Uh, if some of you may have seen our earlier uh, used equipment haul videos, um, um, an earlier one we had like five or seven big huge boulder amplifiers and then recently we had a boulder uh, power amplifier and this is a boulder phono stage. Um, this is a really interesting phono stage. First of all it's true balance only so when you look at the back of the uh, 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 the phono stage, you only have balanced inputs. So you're thinking most turntables, the leads are RCAs. Well, the gentleman also has um, adapters made by Boulder for him so that on the one side you connect your um, RCA inputs and on the other side you connect it to your, um, so here you go. So on one side is RCA and the other side is balanced. And uh, so it comes with this set of adapters. Um, the other thing that's interesting about the phono stage is that it's true dual model and it comes with a variety of different um, equalization curves. So be be uh, besides the RIAA, which is the most common today, back in the 70s there were a few other curves. So this one has, for example, the EMI curve, the Columbia curve, and the FFR curve. Uh, you have all these different controls in the front. You have two uh, uh, cartridge or turntable inputs <clears throat> so you can you can uh, hook up two different cartridges simultaneously or two different tone arms simultaneously um, mono uh, rumble filter and um, anyway power mute and so on and on the back there are uh, slots for the um, for the what they call the personality cards which is basically the um, the cartridge um, uh, loading device, if you will. You can choose between MM or MC on the actual card itself. Um, one of them has already been, been uh, pre-adjusted uh, for 200 ohms, but you can always take the resistor out, you unsolder it, and then when you do that, then the um, standard, it becomes a, a thousand ohms. And if you decide you want a custom, for example, 100 ohms, you put a 100 ohm resistor in there. It's entirely up to you. Or you can switch to MM if you uh, have an MM cartridge. Anyway, that boulder Regular price before was twelve thousand U.S. dollars or sixteen thousand Canadian. We're selling it for six thousand U.S. or eight thousand Canadian. That's half price. Um, let's see what else I can tell you. Oh, if you Google, you will see that Mike Fremer did a review of this and he compared it to the big bar, uh, big brother, the two thousand and eight, I believe it's called. 
and the 2008 is uh, uh, was about 36,000 US dollars or 26 and this one was about 12 so substantially more money and overall although he, he said that although the uh, the more expensive brother was a bit better in the bass and soundstage the mid-range he felt this was actually better it had a warmer smoother richer more three-dimensional mid-range which is saying a lot because it's a whole lot cheaper it's not cheap but it's a whole lot cheaper and again um, uh, Mike will show you how beautiful the cabinet is made one thing about Boulder when it comes to enclosures uh, there are very very few companies that do as good a job as they do um, okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn these both units around and show you the back. Okay. For a preamp, it weighs a ton. Uh. Either that, I'm getting very weak. Okay, so uh, here is the HDMI, the optional HDMI board I was talking about, the HDMI output. Um, these are your phono inputs. By the way, it has both MM and MC phonos, and it's got two of them. So you can, again, connect uh, two different phono stages. I believe I'm right about that. Um, then, of course, you have your RCA line inputs. Uh, these are your digital inputs as well. And uh, Ethernet connection as well as RS-232. Now, that is used for controls like Crestron and so on. Here are your triggers, um, your balanced inputs, RCA outputs, and balanced outputs. And again, you can see these are rhodium plated. So the reason why you use rhodium is because rhodium is inert. It doesn't oxidize over time, just like gold. And some people find that rhodium sounds better. Um, Cardis, for example, uh, for many, many years, I believe they still do, uh, felt that rhodium was the better material than gold, because gold, of course, is just plating, is not real gold. Uh, they felt that rhodium was better, and so they would use uh, rhodium plating. So that's the uh, preamp. Now I'm going to pull this out and show you what it looks like. So first of all, have a look at the, the side. They make these scallop marks, which is uh, a bolder uh, trademark, if you will. It's just absolutely beautiful what they've done there. And again, very, very nice tight seams. They have their own CNC machine, and so they can do all this kind of stuff. And here we go to the back. So your inputs, you have uh, two uh, balanced inputs, as I mentioned only with the adapter you get get out of that problem your ground connections balanced outputs and again if you need to you can use adapters uh, unless your preamplifier has balance it's a true balance design so again it lowers the noise as much as possible and when you're dealing with phono noise is a real issue this really helps um, and then these are your cards these are your personality cards, they call it, and that's where you can notice it says 200 ohm. So this was already made by the factory with a 200 ohm resistor built in. Um, and I guess that's the uh, standard default card, so you can use one with a moving magnet and the other one would be moving coil. So anyway, that's it. That's my story for all of you boys and girls. Um, a little quick preview coming next, oh, our yeah. next review, um, the big boys. Uh, I think we're almost finished burning it in, and uh, let's just say... Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. All right, anyway, thanks for watching this very long video. Hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you next time. Take care, bye-bye.